Hey there, everybody. It's Pastor Jason. Glad that you are joining us for our sermon uh, as we work our way through the book of Mark. Today we'll be in Mark 3, verse 20. You can open your Bibles there. I want to pray for us, and then I've got a couple of videos to share with you, and with, along with a couple of announcements, okay? Father God, I just thank you so much for an opportunity to open your word. I pray you would help us to be faithful stewards of the grace and mercy you give to us fresh and new every day. Lord, we praise you for your son and his sacrifice. We are richly blessed. We are richly blessed with the gift of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Help us to be good stewards of the grace and mercy you give us each and every day, Father. We thank you. We praise you. Help us to make your name great. Help us to desire to expand your kingdom. In your name, amen. Well, a quick couple of announcements before we get started today. Uh, Family camp. Those of you who are wondering, are we going to do family camp this year? We had plans to kind of even hold the reservation until the last possible moment and just let people just go and have a place to camp because it's just kind of difficult to even find campsites at the moment. They are not currently open. Pamplin Grove is currently closed still. And I th- we're going to call it. We're going to say that family camp is not happening this year. It's sad. I know. I wish I could go. It's just one of those things. In terms of men's and women's retreat, we're still looking into those. We're still hoping that those will be open. Okay? Uh, Announcement number two is our lovely Meredith Weiser is stepping down as leader from our women's ministry. And she has a short video of thank you. And we'll play that right here. Hi, friends. I just wanted to say thank you for allowing me to serve as a women's ministry leader at church and um, just to tell you how much it's blessed me more than I can even say. So thank you very much. And I want to personally thank Meredith. She did a great job. She did exactly what I asked her to do. I asked her to lead women's ministry for several years, and she has done a great job of doing that. So women we we're looking for some women to step up and continue to lead women's ministry contact me if maybe you are interested and we'll see if that's a good fit and the third announcement i've got for you the third and final announcement is rachel wingler has got some exciting news to share with us and she's got that in video form so rachel wingler take it away hi grace church family it's me i'm back um i just wanted to pop in and say thank you guys so 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 much um, for your just answer to prayer basically um, because of you guys and your prayers and your generosity and your encouragement and commitment I have met my support raising goal and I am over the moon the Lord has really really blessed me with amazing ministry partners and you guys and I I can't even believe it I'm so 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 excited and I'm so thankful um, you guys have been a huge blessing and just thank you. Just thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, I just, yeah, I'm almost speechless because it's just so amazing the way um, this community has really come alongside me to send me off in this new season. Um, I'm just, yeah, thankful. Um, If you were wanting to partner with me and you hadn't gotten the chance, you definitely still can. There is definitely space for you to still be a ministry partner. And I would love to have you on my team. Uh, I will attach my email again, just in case you're interested in partnering with me. Um, And I would love to have as many people as possible to receive my newsletter and to know what's going on. So if you want to pass along your information um, for me to add you to my newsletter, I would love to do that. Um, I'll be sending out newsletters every month and you'll get to hear a little bit about what I'm doing with some pictures and some information and also prayer, um, different requests for prayer. And you can tell me what I can be praying for you for, and I would love to do that. So I'm so excited. Thank you guys so, so much. If you could be praying for me in this next few weeks as we're finalizing our travel plans and getting special permission to enter the country, um, just that that would all go really smoothly and that there would be no hiccups in our travel plans. Um, Yeah, just thank you guys so much for your continued support and prayer and encouragement. It means the absolute world to me and you guys are so awesome so thank you so much 
Let me pray for our time and we'll get started. Lord, I just pray that we would hear from you today. Lord, I pray that the, those who are listening to this sermon hear from you and that your word indelibly changes their lives. Father, help us to be more like you. Help us to be willing to make your name great. Expand your kingdom, Father. Help us to be good stewards of the grace and mercy you've bestowed on us. Help us to give it away to others and encourage them to a life with Christ. We praise you, Father, in your name. Amen. Well, today we'll be reading through Mark 3, verses 20 to 35. It's a lesson on the three different ways people react to or respond to Jesus. Now, there's a little tiny mini lesson I want to give before we get started for those who are maybe new to the faith, uh, or maybe you're just kind of reinvigorating your spiritual life and you're trying to learn new skills. Some people ask us all the time, hey, what version of the Bible do you read out of? And we read the New American Standard Bible, NASB. There are certain versions of the Bible that you can get that's called a parallel Bible, which gives you usually four columns, and they have four different versions of the Bible. And that way you can see one scripture and how it is presented in four different translations. Today, we'll be talking about a harmony of the Gospels, which is a different thing. A harmony of the Gospels is one that takes any account in Scripture and then matches it up in the different Gospels, so where you can find every account within the Gospels, and it kind of puts them together. Okay, So a great harmony of Mark 3 is found in Matthew 12, and I would encourage you to read all of the, this section of scripture in Matthew um, because I'm going to be inserting uh, one or two scriptures from Matthew's account. Not all of it. There's a good chunk that's, that I'm not going to uh, insert just because of brevity's sake here on the video. So we're going to start in Mark 3, uh, verse 20, and then I'll insert one or two verses from Matthew 12 where they belong. Verse 20. And Jesus came home, and the crowd gathered again to such an extent that they could not even eat a meal. When his own people heard of this, they went out to take custody of him, for they were saying, He has lost his senses. The scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebul, and he casts out demons by the ruler of demons. And he called them to himself and began speaking to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house is not able to stand. If Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand. But he is finished. But no one can enter the strong man's house and plunder his property unless he first binds the strong man and then plunders his house. And here in Matthew 12, verse 30, it's recorded that Jesus says, He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. And then Matthew continues on a little bit more. Verse 28, truly I say to you, all sins shall be forgiven the sons of men, and whatever blasphemes they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin, because they were saying he has an unclean spirit. Verse 31, then his mother and his brothers arrived, and standing outside, they sent word to him, and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Behold, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Answering them, he said, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking out at those who were sitting around him, in Matthew 12, 49, it's recorded that he said he stretched out his hand toward his disciples. Jesus said, Behold, my brother 
my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and mother. And in Luke 8, 21, it says that these who hear the word of God and do it are his mother and brother and sisters. So, we are looking at the three different responses people have to Jesus. We've got his own family. We've got those who were threatened by Jesus and his followers. Well, that first group of people, his family, who were like, he's lost his senses. I'd like to address them last, so we'll get to them. Well, then there's the second group of people, those who were threatened by Jesus, the scribes and the Pharisees. They even accuse him of being in league with Satan. Interestingly, the Mark passage here, it says that the scribes were talking about this as they were coming down from Jerusalem. So while they were traveling, they were openly talking about how Jesus was, uh, had the power of demons. And in Matthew, it records that Jesus knew their thoughts. It's interesting, right? It's interesting because it says here in Mark, he had to call them to himself once they were there. We get, the, if, we don't, if we don't read the scripture antiseptically, if we recognize that there's an environment that these people are actually operating in and that there's a gigantic crowd gathered in this house so thick that they couldn't even eat dinner. You've got these scribes and Pharisees who've come down out of Jerusalem openly talking about Jesus, but once they were there, they've stopped. Or maybe they're just whispering it. That's kind of the sense you get, that Jesus knew their thoughts from across a crowd. And then he's, I can almost, I can almost imagine it. Hey, make way. Let the scribes come through. I got, I got something I got to say to them. Yeah, make, yeah, that's right. The Pharisees, let them through. Let them come on down. Scribes, Pharisees, come on down. You're the next to deal with Jesus Christ of Nazareth. The next interesting thing is to see how Jesus started this interaction. Like so many other times, that we read over and over in scripture, Christ uses a thought-provoking question to open the conversation. A lot of people are befuddled about how to interact with people who don't know Jesus. They're befuddled on how to start a spiritual conversation with people. Follow Jesus' example. Ask a spiritual question. Just ask them a question. Let them do the talking. It might even be like Jesus where it's a rhetorical question. But we'll dive into a little bit of that, into that a little bit more in just a minute. But the more we set aside our own inhibitions about Scripture and its impact on our lives, the more and more we're going to be comfortable about talking about it and engaging people in a discussion about the Word of God. The more comfortable we are with it, the less awkward it will be for other people. You ever do that sometimes? Like, it just seems awkward, and it's awkward. Oh, I don't, and it's just because you're, it's like an awkward feedback loop. And really all it takes is just one person to enter the situation who's, ah, no, it's no big deal. Let's do this. Oh, okay. And the, the awkwardness just seems to dissipate. Well, Jesus, he starts off by explaining the fallacy in their thinking. He points out the obvious logical issues about their thinking, about their accusations. He then points out what he's going to do about the insults directed toward himself. The, the blasphemies even towards the Son of Man, says the scripture in Matthew, Matthew 12, 32, will be forgiven. He's even willing to take on those blasphemies. 
But then he points out an unforgivable sin. He points out the seriousness of blaspheming the one he's about to send after his death and resurrection. After his death and resurrection, the Holy Spirit is going to be our, is going to be God that we're going to interact with on a very daily basis. He makes it clear that we should not be dying without the Holy Spirit. That to deny the Holy Spirit who is trying to gain your attention, to see it as a work of the Lord and to still call it evil, man, don't fall into that unrighteousness. Let me warn you, don't fall into that righteousness, unrighteousness. Don't allow Satan that foothold. And that is not to say that sometimes we Christians, you know, as the years and decades go by, sometimes we question ourselves. Oh, am I, am I doing something to deny the Holy Spirit? Am I blaspheming against the Holy Spirit? I'm concerned that I might be. I think I'm willing to say that if you've got a concern about that, that you're in the right place, that you haven't committed that sin that leads to death. To die without the Holy Spirit is that unforgivable sin. There's nothing you can do once you're dead. And lastly, Christ draws a clear line in the sand in terms of who is counted among his people. And that's where that Matthew 12.30 verse comes in. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. Leaves no room for error, error does it? There's no in-between. There's no sitters, like Pastor Gary was telling us last week. He who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters. Well, the third group of people there are the crowd, right? These are the people who haven't scattered, per se. They've come to see him. They've come to hear him. He's been healing. He's been casting out demons. There's a, he's been feeding people. This is a crowd of people who want to see something miraculous. They want to hear from him. Our first inclination is to automatically assume that these people are doing the right thing. Are any of them there for selfish motive? Whether it's just to simply see something fantastical? Is it something like, oh, I, I need a healing. I don't really care about what you're teaching. I just need to get healed. I don't know. I don't know. I think he spoke directly to those people when he mentioned about those who do not gather with me are scattered. I think those are the sitters that Pastor Gary was telling us about. People who show up to a, show up to church on Sunday and they that's it. That's their that's the level at which they interact with the Lord. We are as close to God as we want to be. Will your faith be easily challenged? Or will Satan have to do a lot of work to challenge your faith? I think this verse in Matthew is a great litmus test for us. For those who are trying to figure out if you're just a sitter or if you really are saved. And again, Jesus begins with a question. This concept of discipleship is something that is done with. Done with. People asked, hey, you're, they said to him, your mother and brothers are outside. You want us to let them in? You let the Pharisees, you let the scribes in. You want us to let, we can make way for them too. 
I can almost hear it. And what does he say? He starts with a question. Who are my mothers and brothers? Discipleship is done with. It's a ministry with. All last year, uh, just as a, a point of personal study, I read several books on just discipleship. I, that, that was my focus of my reading. One thing that is often overlooked in discipleship is the concept that you very well might be discipling someone into an initial interaction with the Lord. It's difficult. To, we don't normally think about discipleship like that. Usually it's disciple like, oh, I'm a churchgoer and I'm starting to, you know, I'm faithful, available, and teachable. Well, sometimes that person isn't a churchgoer yet, but they are faithful, available, and teachable. And we're being called to harvest alongside Christ and disciple those people into an initial relationship with Christ. the more we set our own inhibitions of our spiritual life aside, the less awkward it'll be because it'll be something that we just are comfortable with. We live in it. We just It's like having that perfect sweatshirt that you just don't want to let go of. And that leads us back to our first group of people, right? We're talking about these mothers and brothers and his own family. He has lost his senses. That boy is out of his mind. It's my guess that we all, at some point in our relationship with Christ, come up against this attitude, this sort of reaction to the Holy Spirit from time to time. Don't get me wrong. Like, we'll read scripture, and the first thought that comes into mind is that can't possibly work in today's day and age. Oh, that's script. That's scripture. That's Bible times. That's not 2020. Or well, clearly, this scripture is meant for somebody else and not for me, because there's no way the Lord could do that through me. Let me earnestly urge you: keep your plans open to what the Holy Spirit's plan might be for your life. Take him at his word as long as today is the day. As long as today is still called today. Allow the Holy Spirit to have influence and lordship over what you say and do. So what group are you in? Are you in the family group? Are you in the scribe pharisee group are you in the sitters or are you in the disciples are you in the servants uh right now in this point in time the musical hamilton is a big deal they, they released it on a on a tv service and which allowed everybody access to see it and hear it and everybody loves it uh, i recognize i'm in the minority I don't particularly like it. It's just me. I do not have a musical ear. I admit it. I admit it. But interestingly enough, if you've, not, if you've never seen it, it's not, it's not a big deal. It's all about Alexander Hamilton. Not that big a deal. In the opening of the play, we are, or in the, I should say musical, when the opening of the musical, we are introduced to several characters and they are foreshadowing. They're telling who they're going to be in relationship to who they are and what they have done to Hamilton. It's pretty striking. I, can't, I have to admit, it's a striking sequence. But let me ask you, what does your life say about you in relationship to your relationship with Jesus and what you do for him? Does it truly represent the idea behind the statement, 
I believe in him. I believe in him. At the end of your life, if we looked on the history of your life, I believed in him. In closing, let me encourage you, challenge you to do something even today. Reach out to someone spiritually that you've never reached out to before. Now, what that might look like today might be very radically different than what I would have suggested a few months ago. But it's worth the effort. It's worth the energy. One way for us to respond to Jesus is in baptism. Uh, and we have had a baptism here just recently. So before we close in prayer, we're going to show you a short video, and then I'm going to have Pastor Paul close us in prayer. Again, reach out to someone spiritually this week. Gather with Christ this week. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, we are here this evening to baptize Mr. Jacob Campos. Uh, and I got a chance to talk with him uh, this week. And uh, one thing we do, if you're considering being baptized, is uh, we like to talk about your story, your testimony. Uh, we like to make sure you know what baptism is, that this isn't some uh, weird, whimsical act, but something that is obedient and that you understand what you're doing. And so in talking with, uh, talking with Jake this week, we were talking about the gospel and how he came to understand the gospel uh, as his own and we kind of talked dates and time of when he learned things and how he learned things and on uh, December 15th he entered into Grace Church not for the first time uh, but was just surrounded by the congregates of the church and was watching him worship and study and listen to the message and grow uh, and really saw the verse in Matthew where it says let your light shine before men that they will see your good works and glorify God and he saw what God was doing in the lives of the people that were surrounding him as they worship, as they grow, as they learn. And I think that's where the gospel like started for you. But the gospel isn't necessarily something that uh, everyone grasps all in one seating. Sometimes it's like a multiple course meal where we need to take this in now and take this in later and take this in later. And so in that moment, I think you understood this God thing is real. And I need to look into this more. And I need to like read my Bible. I need to talk with more people. I need to figure this out. And then more recently, uh, June 29th, Jake, you would describe what happens in 2 Corinthians and also in Ephesians 4, which is the putting off of the old self to replace it with the new self, which is only really possible uh, with God in your life, because he's the one removing the old self and giving us a new self and providing us a new self. And so as we're here today in the water, that's really what baptism represents. It's saying, I'm going under the water, and the old self is being washed away. And as we come out of the water, the new self is what's rising again. Now, we, in your mind, that, that has already happened. June 29th is the day where the gospel came to fruition in your life, and you would say you are a child of God. But today is the act of obedience to come before you guys as witnesses and our church as witnesses to say, I intend to live for Christ for the rest of my life. And so Jonathan's here because he's your small group leader, and he's been a huge part in walking you through that journey and walking alongside you and teaching you and discipling and helping, helping you understand those things. And I'm here just to bring the sense of legitimacy as a pastor and as someone who's gotten to hear your story and, and like help you walk through what it is that you've gone through to get to this point today. And so today we're going to baptize you and the old will be gone and the new, if it's representative of the old being gone and the new coming as a witness to others so that maybe they can see the light that's shining through you and want that for themselves. And so if that's you, talk to one of us. We would love to talk to you about what that means and how you could receive the same gospel that Jacob has and how you could be baptized as an act of obedience there as well. Before we baptize you, Jonathan, is there anything that you would like to add? Um, just like we've talked about in small groups, man, uh, you're, we're a big family. And so as you've come to know God and as you've joined the uh, family, obviously the people here, uh, we're here for you. 
And uh, you've talked about not always having the support you need, whether it's in school or in, or in situations like that. And um, But now you have that. you got the people here and you got the people that'll see this in church and stuff. And obviously you got me and our other small group uh, guys and we talk about being a band of brothers and stuff like that. And this is just the symbol, you know, that you're, you've joined the family, man. And so we're here for you. We're here for you now. We're here for you forever. So um, we're, you can't get rid of us. Sorry. Yeah. I'd, say, I'd say that's a huge part of why we do baptism with witnesses. Is so our witnesses here today, if you're in church watching this, that uh, you got a new brother to keep accountable. <laughs> You've got someone to come alongside when you see him in church to be an encouragement, to love on, to appreciate, to celebrate with this moment today and hopefully many other victories moving forward. So we've heard your testimony, and because of your testimony, we know that you're a believer in Christ. But I have to ask you this one question. Jake, is it your intention to live for and serve Jesus in his church for the rest of your life? Great. Because of that testimony today, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> yeah.